الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله. We continue with our reading and commentary of Imam Al Ghazali's 40 Principles of Religion. Uh, we are in the we are in the for those who might be joining us for the first time or are not frequent visitors. We are in the um, third, fourth, the third chapter out of four, uh, discussing blameworthy characteristics. We are at the very end of this chapter. Today, we begin by reading the ninth principle, al-ujub, self-admiration. For those of you following in the book, it's page 172. Imam al-Ghazali, he says, rahimahullah, may we benefit from his knowledge in this world and the next. The ninth principle, self-admiration. Allah Ta'ala says, On the day of Hunayn, the battle of Hunayn, when your great numbers pleased you. Allah Ta'ala also says, While they think that they are doing well. Allah Ta'ala also says, Do not claim yourselves to be pure, he is more knowledgeable of whoever is God-fearing. And this is typically how Muslim writers write. They'll begin by mentioning something from the Quran, then they'll begin by mentioning something from the Hadith, then they'll usually use reason and logic, and then they will confirm all of that by statements of people in the past. So Imam al-Ghazali, in most of his books, this is sort of the general way that he, he writes. The Prophet وسلم, said there are three destructive characteristics. Stinginess that is obeyed, meaning that you, you feel like you're stingy and then you, you, you actually act out on being stingy. Caprice that is followed, hawa muttaba, you, you feel your, nefs want, your lower nefs wants you to do something so you follow it. And a person's self-admiration. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said destruction is in two things, despair and self-admiration. He combined these two because a desperate person does not seek happiness due to his despair, while a person who admires himself does not seek it due to his belief that he has already attained it. So um, despair and self-admiration in a way are two extremes. And both of those extremes are people that will, will, will not make it. The Prophet wasallam said, if you do not commit sins, I would fear for you what is greater than that, Self-admiration, self-admiration. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying one of the, first of all, as human beings, we are always going to sin. And that's why we spend time like this uh, on, a, on a weekend or in a morning or we read a book like this. So we can remind ourselves, we're not going to read this and you know, be, be cured and, and never sin. No, we will sin and sin and sin. But one of the benefits of sin is that you feel bad about what you've done, so you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this hadith, the Prophet is saying, look, if you didn't sin, there's another fear that would happen is that you would become full of yourself. You'd become arrogant. You'd think that you're so perfect, that you're so pure. And that's even worse than sinning and repenting. Aisha alayhi salam was asked, when is a man doing bad? And she said, when he thinks that he is doing well. <laughs> a man looked at Bishr ibn Mansur, as he was prolonging the prayer and performing worship well. When he finished, he said, do not be deceived by what you have seen from me. For indeed, Iblis worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and prayed for thousands of years and then became what he has become. Okay, the reality of self-admiration. The reality of self-admiration is to magnify the self and its characteristics, which are blessings, and to rely on them, forgetting the bestower of blessings and feeling secure about not losing them. If in addition to this, a person sees himself as having some entitlement or position with Allah, then this is called conceit. One report says, indeed the prayer of the conceited does not rise above his head. Okay, so self-admiration is to take the blessings that you've been given and to start to rely on those, not relying on the one who has given you those blessings in the first place. And then if you add to that, that you, you feel you are deserving of those blessings, then that's called conceit, which is even worse because 
in reality, we are not worthy of anything. Allah Ta'ala bestows and bestows and bestows, and then therefore we are grateful. So another way of saying it, if you just come around it from, from another entrance, is that what we want to do is we want to be grateful. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا إِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you are grateful, I will give you increase. So the blessings that we have, which are endless, we just be grateful for them. Say, Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me. That's all you have to do is say, Alhamdulillah. But don't start thinking, oh, I'm so good, I'm so smart that this happened, that this happened. Because that might be taken away from you. Or you start relying on those things and not relying on the one who gave them to you in the first place. So this is about the disposition of the heart. This is not about um, feeling miserable, you know, but rather to acknowledge that what we have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sign of conceit is that the person is amazed at his supplication being rejected and at the good condition of the one who annoys him. Self-admiration is the cause of pride. However, pride requires someone else to be arrogant towards, while self-admiration -admir is conceivable individually. As for those who see Allah Ta'ala's blessing upon them through some deed, knowledge, or anything else, who fears its cessation and rejoices in Allah Ta'ala's blessing simply because it is from Allah Ta'ala, he is not guilty of self-admiration. Rather, the person who admires himself is someone who feels secure and forgets to attribute the blessings to their bestower. Okay, so again, just what I was saying is we just want to say, Alhamdulillah, this is from Allah Ta'ala's blessing upon us. How do we treat self-admiration? Self-admiration is pure ignorance, therefore its treatment is pure knowledge. If a person admires himself due to strength, wealth, beauty, or some other affair, this is not attached to his choice, then it is also ignorance. These things are not from him, so he should admire the one who gave him that thing without him deserving it. He should also reflect on the fact that the loss of that blessing is an imminent threat as a consequence of the last bit of illness or weakness. If a person admires his knowledge or deeds and what falls under his choice, then he should reflect on what facilitated those deeds for him and that they were not facilitated except by limb, ability, will, and knowledge. All of these things are among Allah Ta'ala's creation. If Allah created the limb and the ability, subjugated the means, and removed all distractions, then that action happened necessarily. The compelled has no right to admire what occurs from him by necessity, for he is compelled to choose it. So Allah Ta'ala creates in you a certain capacity, like, you know, our nervous system and we breathe and our blood circulation. Allah Ta'ala creates it to do those things. So we have no choice in the matter. Likewise for everything else when you think about it. He does not, uh, he does not do something if he wills, but only if Allah wills. Whether he wills or does not will is irrelevant. So long as will is a matter created within him, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ and you do not will unless Allah Ta'ala wills it. So no matter what you want to do, if Allah doesn't allow you to do it, it's not going to happen. The key to action is the imposition of will, turning away from all diversions, along with complete physical capacity, all of which is in Allah Ta'ala's hand. Consider, if the key to the treasury was in the king's hand, and he gave it to you, and you took money from the treasury, would you admire his generosity when he gave you the key without you deserving it? Or would you admire your full capacity to take it? What real capacity is there except than being put in position? Those who make a gift of Allah Ta'ala reason for deserving another gift. Among the truly astonishing things is that a rational person admire his knowledge and reason to the extent that he is astonished if Allah Ta'ala impoverishes him and enriches someone else who is ignorant. Allah Ta'ala says, or he says, sorry, how can Allah spread blessings over an ignorant person and deny me? So you see somebody who's more wealthy than you, and you start to think, you know, I deserve that. But why is that person wealthy? You know, why am I not the wealthy one? He has answered, how can he provide you with knowledge and reason and deny them to the ignorant person? This is a gift from him. Do you make it a reason for deserving another gift? Rather, if he combined in you both reason and wealth, and, den and denied both of them to the ignorant person altogether, that would be more worthy of astonishment. The rational person's astonishment at this is just like the astonishment of someone to whom a king has given a horse while he was given someone else a slave. The former asks, how could he be, how could he give a slave to so-and-so when he doesn't even have a horse and deny me when I own a horse? He only came to own a horse through the king's giving, yet he makes his gift a reason for deserving another gift 
This is the quintessential ignorance. Allah Ta'ala gives you something. So you don't acknowledge the gift that you were giving. You assume that you are entitled for that thing that you've been given. And then you think because you have falsely ascribed that gift to your own ability. You say, why hasn't Allah given me something else? That's what he's saying. So he's like thinking about how ignorant that is. That thing that you have in the beginning is a gift to start out with. Your life is a gift. Your wealth is a gift. Your family is a gift. Your health is a gift. Your community is a gift. You know, so on and so forth. If you come to count those, you will not, never be able to count them. So acknowledge what you have as a gift and say, Alhamdulillah. Don't just assume that, yes, I am, you know, my degree is because I'm smart and I worked hard. My wealth is because I worked hard and I got a good job. Don't fall into that trap. Why? Because working hard does not equate with a certain outcome. There are many people who don't work hard that are very wealthy. There are also many people who work hard and that are wealthy. There are many people who are smart and are wealthy. And there are many, many people who are smart and not wealthy. So those two things are different. The causality is different. So this is really an issue of causality. Yes, you know, if you work hard and you study hard and, and you learn and, you know, the idea is that hopefully you will be able to advance more, but you will only be able to advance if Allah allows it. That's what Imam al-Ghazali is reminding of. So say, Alhamdulillah. Instead, the truly rational person is always amazed at Allah Ta'ala's grace and generosity from whence he gave him knowledge and reason and provided him with the means and capacity to worship without any entitlement from him. He denied that to another, subjugated him to that which calls to corruption and compelled him to it by turning away from him that which calls to good without any previous crime on his part. If a person truly witnesses this, then fear will overcome him. He might say, Allah has blessed me in this world without any means on my part and singled me out with it to the exclusion of others. Whoever does the like of this for no reason must be quick to punish, also without any crime or reason. What shall I do if the blessing bestowed upon me are a plot or a gradual misguidance? So he's saying the smart person will be more embarrassed. Oh my God, Allah Ta'ala has given me all of this. I hope this is not a sign of this verse. فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِحُوا بِمَا أُوتُوا أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بَغْتَةً we opened the doors of everything to them until they rejoiced in what they were given. Then we took it away from them unexpectedly. Allah Ta'ala also says, We will gradually misguide them from where they do not know. So he's like, if you are a thinking person, then you will be fearful that the blessings that you have, of which you acknowledge, come only from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. You will be fearful that this will be a way to distract you from the truth, rather than the other side, which is just to assume that you're deserving of these things. Okay, that's the ninth principle, which is self-admiration. And then this is the 10th and final principle in this chapter, uh, which is ostentation, we, we, I think this is a long chapter, we won't finish it today. And then after this, there's a concluding chapter. And then we will begin the last fourth of the book. So it occurred to me, when I was preparing that we might end up finishing the book before Ramadan. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes, which would be nice. And nice. usually we don't, we're not able to finish before Ramadan. Okay, ostentation, showing off. Allah Ta'ala says, Woe to those who pray and are heedless of their prayer, those who are ostentatious. Allah Ta'ala also says, Inna We feed you only for the sake of Allah's countenance. We do not want any reward or thanks from you. Allah Ta'ala also says, Whoever hopes to meet his Lord, let him do righteous deeds. By righteous deeds, he intended sincerity. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Verily the most dreadful thing I fear for you is the minor association of partners with Allah, what we call as shirk al azhar It was asked, and what is that? The Prophet Sallallahu said, ostentation, Allah Ta'ala will say on the day of resurrection when he rewards the slave for their deeds, go to the people to whom you are ostentatious 
and see if they will, if you will find any reward with them. So people who show off, Yom al Qiyamah, Allah Taala says, go to those people who you used to show off to, see if they're going to help you now. Right. So that hadith reminds us that you know, who are you showing off to? You're showing off to somebody who, at the end of the day, really can't benefit you or harm you. Only Allah Taala can benefit and harm you. The Prophet Sallallahu said in a long hadith, it will be said to the soldier, the scholar, and the spender when one of them says, this is the long hadith that's in Bukhari and Tirmidhi and others in which Allah Ta'ala talks about the first people to be judged Yom Al-Qiyamah. So Imam Al-Ghazali is sort of like summarizing because it's a very long hadith. Uh, it will be said to the soldier, you know, the person who fought in, the, in a legitimate war and died in the, for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, the scholar, and the one who, who gives money, who's a philanthropist, uh, it will be said to them, I, they will say, I did this and that. They will tell, they will tell Allah Ta'ala, well, you gave me all of these gifts and I use them for your sake. Allah Ta'ala says you have lied. You wanted it for it to be said that so-and-so is a scholar or brave or generous. So they did this to show off. Then they will be taken to the hellfire. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. The Prophet Sallallahu also said, seek refuge with Allah from the pit of sorrow. It was asked, what is that? He said, a valley in the hellfire that is prepared for those who recite the Quran ostentatiously. So here, it's very interesting. Imam al-Ghazali is talking about people who show off with religious works, right? So these are all people who are, when he says a scholar, he's not talking about like a mathematician. You know, he's talking about a scholar who studied the Sharia, Hadith, Quran, Tafsir, etc. And he's teaching people. When he talks about a soldier, he's like somebody who fought fi sabilillah. When he talks about a philanthropist, he's somebody who gave money fi sabilillah. Which is really the most grotesque form of showing off, right? Because, the, the, you know, we don't want to use religion ever to make ourselves feel, uh, to be full of ourselves and to be arrogant with other people or to show off. But rather we use this way of belief or this way of life to refine ourselves, to become better. The Prophet ﷺ also said, Allah Ta'ala said, whoever performs a deed for me but associates another with me concerning it, it is for him entirely and I am free of it. I am the freest of those free from need and partnership. You know, Allah Ta'ala does not accept a partner with him. La ilaha illallah. Allah Ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ also said, Allah does not accept a deed that has a particle weight of ostentation in it. The Prophet ﷺ also said, verily the slightest bit of ostentation is an association of partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isa salam said, if it is a day that one of you is fasting, then he should put oil on his head and beard and wipe his lips so that the people do not see that he is fasting. If he gives with his right hand, he should hide it from his left hand. And if he prays, he should lower the cover. He should lower the cover over his door. Allah ta'ala most certainly divides praise just as he divided provision. So in this tradition, Christ السلام, is saying, when you go about your, your devotional works, do it in a way that is pure. So you protect yourself so people don't, you know, if you're fasting, don't go around to everyone, oh, I'm fasting today. You know, don't say that, but just, just do it, just fast. And if somebody finds out, they find out, but don't make a big deal about it so you don't change your niya. Now, of course, there are, solutions to all of these so i don't want people to think that you know we're gonna to have to start like hiding everything from one another but he's just kind of taking you step by step for this reason umar radiallahu anhu said to a man who used to tilt his neck to lower his head during prayer oh you with the neck straighten your neck up for humility is not in the necks but in the hearts right so the man is like praying like this you know and you meet people like that like i'm just a, an insignificant servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Umar said, don't act like that. He's like, being sincere is something that's on the inside. You don't, you don't show it on the outside. And I always tell that to my students. I just don't, don't be these false, false adab. You know, there are these Muslims who when they're in the Muslim gatherings and you know, there's like a teacher around or a sheikh, they act all like, oh, you know, can, can I serve you this morsel? If they all start talking weird, like they're from like a Shakespearean player. So you don't talk like that in real life. Just be yourself. Be respectful, but be yourself, right? Because it's a something, all of what we're talking about, this is something on the inside. It's not something that's on the outside. Qatada said, if a slave is ostentatious, Allah Ta'ala says, look at how my slave is mocking me. 
Al Hassan alayhi salam said, I accompanied people who, whenever some point of wisdom occurred to one of them that would have benefited him, both himself and his companions, had he voiced it, he was prevented from doing so because he did not desire fame. Types of action in which ostentation occurs. The reality of ostentation is seeking status in people's heart through worship and good deeds. There are six types of actions that are done ostentatiously. The first is ostentation in respect of the body, so your physical appearance, such as showing skinniness and lightness so that one is thought to stay up praying at night and to fast all day, showing sorrow so that one is thought to be extremely earnest regarding religious affairs. It is, are people having trouble hearing me? I got a message saying that they can't hear me. Can everybody hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. Um, you are fine. You are fine. Okay. Showing sorrow so that one is thought to be extremely earnest regarding religious affairs, showing disheveled hair so that one is thought to be extremely immersed in the religion and has no time to care for himself. Showing chapped lips to suggest that one fasts and lowering the voice to suggest that one is weak from severity of struggling. Right? The, and we can make up our own examples of this today. Um, um, you know, people who are basically faking it is what he's saying. Okay. Uh, and you fake it with your appearance in order to give off or to emphasize something that you're doing religiously. The second is ostentation through form, such as saving the mustache. Okay, let me explain this because this might not make sense to people. So um, this is like a technical fiqh point. So I'll just digress just for a little bit. <clears throat> but you know that we have to wash our face uh, when, we, when, we walk, when we make wudu. And we also know if you're a man, having a beard is a sunnah. But the beard as defined in the sharia doesn't include the mustache. So it's just a technical thing. So the idea is that when you make wudu, if you're a man and you have a beard and you have a mustache like I do, you have to make sure that the water gets on your lips. So what he's saying is you want to show how much taqwa you have so you shave off your, your mustache completely as a sign that you know, I'm not going to have any shred of doubt that when I make wudu, I have my, my lips are washed. Whereas you could just simply wash it like the way you do, you know, any part of your body. That's what he means. Lowering the head while walking, right? Oh, Allah says you have to lower your gaze. So you, 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 walk, you walk like this everywhere you go. And then you end up bumping into people. Moving calmly, leaving the mark of prostration on the face, meaning in the pre-modern world or you know and, and if, if people pray outside or people pray on the sand or in the desert or out in the field when you put your when you make sujood you're going to have some of the grass or some of the sand on your forehead right so you leave that there so people see that you're that you're praying you know you're, you're, that's a sign of your prayer shutting the eyes in order for it to be thought that one is in a state of spiritual ecstasy unveiling or deep thought Right, so, so the, the imam starts talking and you just, so you know, you're like this. Whereas you're just really sleeping. You're just <laughs> falling asleep because what the imam is being boring, but you're, you're, you're trying to give off this, that you're like Mr. Taqwa, you know, oh, just taking it all in, right? So don't do stuff like that, right? That's all fake. You're just showing off, you're, you're drawing attention because you're not usually like that. But if it comes from within you, if the imam happens to say something that just, you know, blows your socks off, that's fine if it's, if it's not affected and if it's not made up. The third is in regards to clothes. Like, this is one of my favorites. Like wearing wool or another rough material. In the pre-modern world, the Sufis, the people that devote themselves to worship and dhikr, they would wear suf, they would wear wool, coarse, like a coarse outer garment. And that's a sign that they're not into fashion. They're not into the, you know, they're, they're only in this life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there used to be different Sufi orders and tariqahs that they would dress a certain way. I mean, you still have that to a certain extent. So 
when he says wearing wool, it means we can translate it as wearing clothes that distinguish your religiosity. Okay, so it's not just like wear, it's not like if you wear a suit that's made out of wool, if you're a man or a woman, you're like showing off. That's not what he means. Shortening a garment, listen to this, shortening a garment up to close to half of the shin, right, for men, right, you, you roll up your pants, or you roll up your thobe, <laughs> right, because, because of the hadith of not wearing your garment long, so you over exaggerate that. Shortening the sleeves, and leaving the garment dirty, or with holes, right, so you're so uh, you're such a zahid in this life that you don't even care if your clothes are tattered or, or, or disheveled, right? You're just, you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order for it to be thought that one has no time to take care of their clothes, wearing patched clothing and praying on a rug, meaning praying in luxury, in order to be considered one of the Sufis, despite being bankrupt concerning the reality of Sufism. Wearing a garment with tight sleeves or a seamless shawl or widening the sleeves in order to be thought a scholar, meaning putting on the clothes of a scholar, like the big jubba that has like the big sleeves and stuff like that, or putting a sheet over the turban and wearing socks. So um, the Prophet Sallallahu used to, in, in some of the narrations, he would wear a turban and then he would put the sheet over the turban, uh, which, is a, which is a sunnah, a taylasan it's called. And Imam Asuti has a little booklet about that, demonstrating that it's a sunnah. At that time, this was a sign of, uh, of scholarship. Uh, in Al-Azhar, uh, in the pre-modern um, pre time, when a student would graduate, when he would take his oral exams, and they do the salawat that we end our class with, they would give him this taila, so they would give him this shawl, and they would put it over his turban. So he would walk around town that day as a sign that he passed his exams. It was a sign of, at that time, it was like a sign of piety. So he's, he's, he's saying you walk around like that all the time. Or putting, uh, putting wearing socks, made, like wearing like the thick hoof, in order to, for it to be thought that one is an ascetic due to his extreme caution from the dust on the street. Right? These are examples at his time. You can supplement this with all type of examples now. People dressing a certain way to give off a certain sign that they are of a religious nature. And it's very, very dangerous to do that. You don't want to distinguish yourself with your dress religiously unless there's a reason. Like if somebody's a teacher or a scholar or delivering the khutbah, I mean, that's a time where, or somebody's a mufti, that's, you have to dress like that because you want people to know they can ask you questions or come to you for advice. But if you just do that all the time, then it's sort of like he's like saying, you're just, you know, that's not natural. Then there are those who seek status in the hearts of righteous people so that they wear shabby clothes. And if they are burdened with wearing a nice new garment, which is permitted in the Sharia and was worn by the pious predecessors, they would view it like slaughter, fearing that people would say it seemed ac acceptable to him as asceticism. So you want people to think that you are an ascetic. So you avoid nice things. Among them is the one who seeks status with the sultans and merchants or you know, people in power or wealthy people through expensive patched wool clothes. If he were to wear shabby clothes, they would surely ridicule him. And if he wore upscale clothes, they would not believe he was an ascetic. So he seeks dyed patches, fine cloths and high quality wool. His clothes are valuable and rare like the clothes of the rich, yet their color and form are like the clothes of the righteous. So he's like faking it. So you, you look like a faqir, you look like a Sufi, but you know, your outfit is several thousand dollars because you, you've patched it together. So it's not authentic. Um, if they were burdened with wearing fine materials, which is permissible to wear, yet it, its value was less than the value of the clothes of the rich, it would be extremely difficult for them due to their feel of fear of diminished status in the hearts of the righteous. Who will say it seemed acceptable to him as asceticism. The fourth is ostentation through statements, such as the ostentation of preachers using flowery, flowery language and choking or cheering up when relating points of wisdom. You know, there are people who can cry on demand. You know, every time they give a talk, they're always going to cry like at the same time, right? That's affected. It's not real. If you choke up, uh, that's natural. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you choke up all the time, 
at the same time, then there's something wrong. Uh, they, they choke up and tearing when relating points of wisdom, hadith, or statements of the pious ancestors. Despite these as, actions, the ostentatious person is all the while devoid of realities of truthfulness and sincerely, sincerity inwardly. Rather, it is also that the speaker may be thought of as possessing these qualities. Hence, he displays sorrow before an audience, yet do, disobeys Allah in private. Another example is claiming to have memorized hadith or to have met sheikhs and being quick to judge a hadith as sound or defective so that one may be thought to possess an abundance of knowledge. Similarly, moving the lips in remembrance or commanding good and forbidding evil in the presence of people while the heart is devoid of grief over disobedience or showing anger over objectable acts and regret over disobedience while the heart is devoid of any hurt. The fifth is ostentation through practice, such as prolonging standing in prayer, bowing and prostrating well. So you, you make your prayer extra long when people are around. Lowering the head, not looking around much, giving charity, fasting, performing the hajj, walking humbly and closing the eyes. The ostentation person does these things while Allah Ta'ala knows of his inner self that if he were alone, he would do none of it. Rather, he would pray lazily, walk hastily, indeed, he might do that when walking, but if he were to feel someone looking at him, he would return to tranquility so as to be regarded as a being amongst the humble. The sixth is ostentation through a person having many students and companions or frequently mentioning sheikhs so that he may be thought of to have met many of them. This is like someone who loves to be visited by scholars and sultans so that it might be said that he is amongst those from whom blessings are sought. The aforementioned are the main ways in which people are ostentatious within the religion, all of which is harmful. In fact, they are amongst the major sins. As for seeking status in the hearts of people through actions that are not acts of worship or religion, this is not prohibited so long as there is no deception, as we have mentioned in regarding to seeking status. Worldly people may seek status through abundant wealth and slaves, beautiful, high-end clothes, memorizing poetry, knowledge of medicine, mathematics, grammar, lexog lexology, and other deeds and states. This is not prohibited so long as it does not lead to annoying others with arrogance or other blameworthy characteristics. We have elaborated upon the types of ostentation because it is the most dominant blameworthy characteristic of the self. Whoever does not know evil and its place is not able to be aware of it, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. So all of these things that he's talking about, these are all major sins. To use any aspect of the deen and by doing it, saying it, to show off to somebody else your level of religiosity, whether it's your knowledge or whether it's your practice or whether it's your sincerity. If we are truly sincere in our practice of our faith, then we will be consistent. We will, we will do the things we do, say the things we say, whether we are in public or in private, whether we are in a gathering or we are at home, whether we are at the masjid or we are you know, in the office or whether we are by ourselves. Um, and that's very important is that one of the things, one of the difficult lessons I think for people to learn is religion is not meant to be something that distinguishes us. We are not meant to have little groups within the religion, but rather religion has, our faith, our religion has come to refine us. And we are all one community. Yes, there are people that are more learned and yes, there are people that are more knowledgeable and people play different roles, but even those people that play the roles, this message is for them as, I mean, he mentions that, this even messages for them as well, is that their job is to teach for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not so that people can say, oh, this person is knowledgeable, so on and so forth. So this is, the reason this chapter is long is because you can see how intricate it can get. We'll read a little bit more. Uh, we won't finish it. I think it's too long, but I'll read a couple more pages. Okay, levels of ostentation. Ostentation is despicable on a number of levels. The first of them is that which is not through religious or devotional affairs, like someone who wears nice clothes when he goes out, contrary to what he wears when alone, and someone who spends extravagantly to host rich people so as to be thought extremely generous, not so as to be thought of as a pious and, pious and righteous. This is not unlawful for indeed possession of hearts 
is like the possession of wealth. Of course, a little bit of it is all right and beneficial, but an abundance of it distracts from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like an abundance of wealth. Whenever aspiration is directed towards increased status, and this leads to heedlessness and acts of disobedience, then it becomes forbidden. For this reason, not in itself. As for showing the aforementioned qualities in order for people to believe that one is religious and pious, this is prohibited for two reasons. So before those reasons, this is also a caution for us living as minorities in a non-Muslim majority environment. It's very easy for people to fear, feel some kind of peer pressure that they need to do certain things to fit in. And, uh, you know, you don't always want to be the odd person out. It's just sometimes it's just too much to be. So this advice, what he just said is important. He's like, it's, that's normal to do that. But as long as it doesn't lead to disobedience. So don't cross the line and do the haram. You know, don't start drinking because you, you feel that when you go out with your work colleagues, you don't, well, you can't drink. That's haram. It's a major sin. So that's just one thing that you're not going to be able to do. But you can go out and, and be with your uh, work people as much as is necessary because there's, a, there's maslaha for you. There's some benefit for you. You have to do that. That's part of the job culture. But don't go and do the haram. Don't, don't go over that line to do something that you know is haram because that haram act is going to be haram no matter what the circumstance. That's what he's saying. As for the religious stuff, he says it's haram for two reasons. The first reason is that it is a deception. If a person wants people to think that he is sincere and obedient to Allah and loves him, when this intention makes a person an open sinner and hated by Allah. If a man were to hand over money to a group and make them imagine that he is being generous to them, when in fact he is handing over a debt, then he has disobeyed because of his deception, even if he never thought, even if he never sought to be thought of as righteous, because possession of hearts through deception is unlawful. So you're deceiving people if you're showing off and you're not really that thing. The second reason is that if a person seeks Allah's creation through worshiping Allah, then he is a mocker. If someone stands before a king as if he were to serve, yet that is not his aim, his actual aim being the attention of one of the king's slave or slave girls, then ob ob observe the punishment this mocker deserves for his mockery of the king. It is as if he has sought out the slaves through worship, being that Allah Ta'ala's slaves are more able to benefit him or bring him good to him than Allah. For the greatness of the slave in his heart calls him to beautif beautify himself in their presence through worshiping Allah Ta'ala. This is why ostentation is called the minor association of partners with God. So the second reason is that you are giving import to one of God's creation, which is other people. You know, how is that person who you're showing off to going to help you vis-a-vis -vis your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that's why the Prophet Sassim said it's a form, of, it's a minor form of shirk, of association, because you're associating somebody else, you're giving somebody else your attention whereas all of your attention should be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, in matters of religious practice. Furthermore, the sin increases with the increase of corruption in the objective and intention. There are ostentatious people who do not seek anything but plain status. Then there are some who seek to lay down deposits or take over endowments and the wealth of orphans in order to embezzle them, which is undoubtedly even filthier. Some are ostentatious in order to get close to women and boys, so that he's able to engage in debauchery or in order to increase his wealth so as to spend it on wine and musical instruments. This is an even greater sin for he has made worshiping Allah Ta'ala a means to opposing him. We seek refuge from Allah in this. So people that use religion to attract people for nefarious reasons, whether it's for seduction, whether it's for wealth, um, uh, you're, like, you're like a con artist is what he's saying. You know, you're using this facade of religion. And there, I mean, unfortunately, the world is full of these type of people that use religion to, to bring people. It's almost like a cult effect. Like you bring people into your orbit because you are impressing them with your religion. And then you're using that influence that is based on a false notion of religion. And you start manipulating people uh, either to commit the haram or you, you, know, you benefit from them, something like that. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here because I think there are some questions that have come in. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam.
Oh, before the questions, uh, I just want everyone to know that uh, next week, I'm actually going to be traveling exactly at the time of the class. So I'm not going to be able to do the class on Sunday. I apologize. Uh, so uh, next week, which is the 28th of November, let me just make sure that's right. Yeah, the 28th of November, we won't have class. And inshallah, mm -hmm. we'll resume the next, the day after. I apologize. I try to avoid, avoid that, but with COVID uh, flight schedules and stuff are not, they've all changed. So I have no yeah, but in choice. Any case, uh, but in any case, we are planning uh, to give the weekend off because of Thanksgiving. So Oh, that's fine. right. It's Thanksgiving. Oh, Alhamdulillah. Okay. But, okay. If, but if you want to, you can, you can do it yourself. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll take off. So Thanksgiving Mubarak to everyone. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, as we are in a family gathering times, often we have family relatives that don't get along with maybe due to past events. Can you give some pointers on how to attend events where people that are hurt by each other are present? Uh, what is due to each other? Is avoidance an option or is minimizing interaction allowed? If so, does the latter action have ikhlas and intention? Well, the, the, the problem with that question is that it depends on the level of discord in the family. Um, you know, I have the same problem in my extended family. So I, it's not, I mean, I think, I think it just comes with having family. <laughs> and there are many hadith that talk about uh, the haram act of avoiding your Muslim brother or sister for more than three days. And I've all, I, personally, I've grappled with, with exactly this question because I don't want to fall into that hadith uh, and avoid, but sometimes I feel that there are certain family members, you know, in the wider family that it's just, I mean, every time you come into their orbit, it's just all bad. So I think the issue, the problem is that as Westerners, oftentimes we think of things as black and white. So it's not about avoiding them completely or like being their best friend, but it's not avoiding them. So for example, like it's Thanksgiving, you can send them a message, happy Thanksgiving. It's Eid, you can send them a message. It could be a text message or it could be on social media or whatever, you know, it doesn't have to be you can, a phone call. You can send them a postcard, you can send them a letter or something like that just to comply. That's in the case where it's like super toxic. Um, in the case where it's just silly stuff, then my advice is that when you get together, not to talk about those things, you know, you have to, you have to forgive and forget. And if you are able to be the bigger person and forgive, even if you feel that you were wronged, then you have to, you know, do that. And you will be immensely rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to understand, you have to link it to that belief that you will be rewarded. It's a tough one. I admit it's a very tough one. Um, but especially as a minority community, we cannot afford to have more fractures. You know, we are already a minority. So there's no, it's not in anyone, especially our, our children or the next generation or the, or the next one to two generations. We don't want them growing up knowing about these type of splits. Uh, we are a religion of community. The whole Islamic calendar began with the hijrah, began with the formation of the formal community. Allah Ta'ala says that he's with the community. The Prophet Sallallahu advised us to be in the community. Allah Ta'ala calls us one ummah, one community. So we have to remember those things. And sometimes you just have to forgive and forget and be the better person and move forward, even if you feel that you are wrong. That's, you know, in cases where it's not like explosive, if it's explosive and it's like serious, you have to just find other ways of, you know, staying in touch like once a quarter, I would say, or once every six months. A good practice in several tradition congregants dress with traditional clothes on Fridays and Jewish congregants do so on Saturday to celebrate the day. Yeah, traditional clothes, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not what he's talking about. Imam al-Ghazali is talking about, I'm going to dress like a pious person, whatever that means, whatever, whatever you know, we, we think, okay, let me just be very blunt. You know, the person that goes to the Arabian Gulf, you know, they go to Hajj or they go to Umrah and then they come back and they start dressing like people like that. That's not their tradition, right? That's not their tradition. Like you have all these people 
in Malaysia, in India, in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, in, in North Africa, dressing like they're, they're Saudis, like Saudi imams. That's, that's sort of what Imam al-Ghazali is talking about, because that's cultural dress. That's not necessarily the dress of um, like you've been to a certain seminary and you wear the clothes of that seminary or something like that. So that's what he's talking about. I'm all for uh, our cultural expression. I think that's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with, with dressing more, I use the term with trepidation, but Islamically on Islamic functions as well. On Eid, on Friday, there's nothing wrong with that as well. He's talking about, I'm going to put on this outfit because I want people to know that I'm Mr. Pius or I'm Mrs. Pius. That's, what, that's where the danger is. It's easy to become paralyzed when trying to determine whether you're doing something sincerely or showing off. Do you have advice for dealing with this predicament? Don't pay attention to your feelings and do the act that you set out to do it. Allah Ta'ala says, عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ So when you decide and determine to do something, do it. Um, it takes practice, but the act is better than the non-act because the non-act, if you get used to, if you, if you accustom yourselves, yourself to the non-act, then what's going to end up happening on the balance sheet is you, you miss the act. It's much better, as he will say later, we'll get to next class, it's much better to do the act and to struggle with your intention rather than not to do the act at all. So my advice is do the act. And when you stand to do the act, remind yourself that this is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if like you walk into the mosque and somebody gave the adhan and you're like, okay, I just, I'm going to pray the fard. I'm too tired. I'm too lazy to pray the sunnah. And then it, two, three people stand up to pray, pray the sunnah. Stand up and pray the sunnah. And say, alhamdulillah, I was reminded. Have some kind of self-talk. Don't be so obsessed with, oh, I'm only standing up because they stood up. Because, you know, we all do that. But we also want to be reminded of good works and, and, as well. So there's nothing wrong with that. So act. Always err on the side of, be biased towards action. Make the act and then remind yourself that this is intention. Over time, when you, when you, your spiritual relationship with Allah Ta'ala moves, uh, matures, you will not have those feelings. The second thing is it's very important to remember the power of habit. So if you become, um, if a certain act, act becomes habitual for you, if it's a habit and it's a, it's a strongly ingrained habit, then you're not really going to ever worry about I'm doing this because of someone or not someone because it's a habit and you're just used to doing it. The key to habit is consistency. The key to consistency is not doing too much. So you pick a favorite act. Maybe it's fasting a day in the month. Maybe it's every time you get a paycheck, you, you give like 50 bucks or 100 bucks donation. Maybe it's um, praying two extra rakahs somewhere throughout the day. Take something really small like that and then continue to do it. Eventually, you will find yourself doing that act in public and in private, in public and in private, but you won't be phased because it's a habit. It's just ingrained. Uh, it's the same thing with people when they do dhikr and they carry like a dhikr bead or something like that and they're used to saying dhikr. Well, if it's a habit, if it's something that you've committed to doing twice a day, uh, inevitably you're going to end up doing it when people are around, but you're not concerned about them. You're concerned about the habit. So my, my two pieces of advice are to err on the side of action and to, to form new, you know, religious spiritual habits by being consistent. The key to being consistent is just taking a little bit. Uh, during this time of the year, how do you suggest interacting with Christian friends, family, when they are engaged in prayer at Thanksgiving should we remove ourselves or is it okay to stay and not an act of worship? There are no religious acts of worship in Thanksgiving. There are religious sentiments that we express because all religions talk about gratitude. So Thanksgiving is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, just by way of full disclosure, we had our Thanksgiving dinner on Friday. Uh, this past Friday, we had some Egyptian American friends and the kids came over and we had turkey and we had pie and and everything, and it's just a tradition that we do, and it's fun and everything. And um, it, 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 for those of you who have non-Muslim family, it's a it's an awesome, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to express this universal concept of gratitude and thanksgiving. 
So it's not like going to church for mass where I'd be like, okay, you can just go and like observe because that's a formal act of worship or like going to a temple and, and on a special holiday and prostrating or that we can't do that because that is an act of worship. But saying a prayer or saying grace, there's nothing wrong with that because uh, these are all sentiments that we express too and we can add to it. There are a lot of YouTube videos about Quran recitation and Hadith. That's the first problem is that there's a lot of you, there's a lot of stuff out there. So you have to find, you have to develop a filtering system. Uh, these are benefiting a lot of people and also it pays back to the producer. How can we distinguish which of these are produced with sincerity? Do we have any obligation to not promote an insincere work like these? Well, if, if you're benefiting from something, don't worry about what that person's intention is um, because you're not responsible for that. That person's intention, that's between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you find a product, an Islamic product or a class or a course or whatever, a subscription, whatever you're doing and it's helping you, that's good that Allah Ta'ala put that in your way. Uh, there's a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says something along the lines that Allah Ta'ala will give victory to this religion through a person who is a fasiq, a corrupt person. And Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, when he would narrate this hadith, he, he said, I feared that this hadith was mentioned because of me. I mean, this is Sayyidina Umar speaking, radiallahu anhu. So there can be corrupt people, morally corrupt people who almost by accident end up spreading things about Islam and people benefiting from them. So that is a concept that we have that exists. So you're not responsible for that. Um, and if you find something that's benefiting you, that's improving your relationship with the Quran, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you know, you're okay. You don't have any share in that. If you're very worried about somebody specific, you can ask me in private and we can talk about it. But in general, that would be my answer. Is it okay for me to dress like a typical Sri Lankan and cover my head or wear hijab only when I come to ICCP? Yes, and we will love you for it, Siti Aunty. I, 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 I encourage that. Don't we have the lungi night every, every year in Ramadan? So, I mean, it's the same. There's nothing wrong with that. Alhamdulillah. Earlier you said we can go out with coworkers, but make sure we don't do anything haram. Is there a hadith that states if you are sitting in a gathering where people are drinking, then you earn the same sin? Yes, but that hadith is for the context in a Muslim majority context. So if you're living as a Muslim minority where, you know, it's not only is it not haram, but it's, it's considered normal and, you know, almost praiseworthy that you have a drink and there are manuals about how to drink and this and that. It's, it, it means the exact opposite in the non-Muslim world than it does in the Muslim world then that hadith does not apply about sitting because of umum and balwa because of the great um, difficulty that it's so profuse everywhere. I mean, I'm not saying go sit in those places on purpose, but if there's like a work obligation or something like that, then, you know, you're, you're okay. <clears throat> Any questions? Any other questions that people have? Okay, so just to recap, uh, I totally forgot that this week is Thanksgiving. So there's no class on Sunday because of Thanksgiving, let's say, not because I'm traveling, but because of Thanksgiving. So everyone, I hope everyone has a, a good uh, holiday break uh, and spend some time with family. And, um, you know, re is a good time to reconnect the bonds with, with the family and with the community. So uh, uh, I pray that it's a safe holiday for everyone, inshallah, and we will resume, inshallah, the Sunday, the Sunday after that. If there happy are no questions. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you and to our family. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Dr. Mir, too, alhamdulillah. Thank you. Inshallah, inshallah, we'll, uh, next year, inshallah, hopefully we'll have a big Thanksgiving gathering, inshallah. <laughs> وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صلي أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى 
آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك وميداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Happy Thanksgiving